Holy sh! I have hands! Hello and welcome to a new series I wanted to try called Things on My Shelf. Specifically the shelves of records I have. I also have a bookshelf and a few video game shelves. But considering this channel is called Flaff Music, I, I don't know how many people would want to hear about Family Guy, the game for PS2. My point is, this is a new series I want to do uh, that's mainly going to be unscripted because I haven't posted much on here. I don't know if you realize that. And that's because it's it's very difficult to consistently do scripted and fully edited stuff. That doesn't mean I'm going to get rid of that. I love doing that stuff, analyzing stuff, breaking down stuff. But I also like this feeling nonchalant approach. And so this is a series, I already told you the name of it. Uh, called Things on My Shelf, Things on My Record Shelf. The, the name is still a work in progress. My point is, um, actually, I don't have much of a point. This is the first episode, um, and each episode, I would like to pick a record off the shelf, um, that has something interesting about it. Um, mainly the record itself, for example, I'm not gonna pick out, like, my copy of Abbey Road, the 2019 remix, because, like, it's a great album. It's one of my favorites of all time, but, um, there's not much interesting in the record. Like, you, you take it out and it's just the record. It's just, woo! Like, but yeah, um, I, I want this to be an opportunity for me to not only explore the record, but also talk a bit about the significance of the album, its history, um, and it's just stuff that I care about. Um, I don't know how long this series will last, how often I'll do it. As many records as I do have, not many of them are super interesting or have much to talk about. But the one I wanted to talk about today was a Frank Ocean record. Um, it is right over here. Endless! It doesn't fit fully in frame unless I go all the way back here. Can I zoom out any further? Yes, you might notice this here. That is a copy of New Super Mario Bros. U on the Wii U. Um, I'm trying to get a tripod at some point. We'll get there. My point is Endless by Frank Ocean, released in 2016. This right here, if it would fit so nice, I'll put it there for now, is a uh, 2016 bootleg pressing. As far as I can tell, there is an official pressing of Endless. Uh, the, the one issue with it is I'm really not in the mood to sell a kidney. As much as I love this album, um, it's not kidney worthy. Not many albums are. But yes, Frank Ocean. I also have a, a Channel Orange sticker up here because I also own the Channel Orange CD. That's not what we're talking about today. I keep getting off topic. Um, Endless is a very interesting release in that it's very difficult to listen to. Uh, granted, you don't have to travel the whole bloody country to find it. It's some weird f***ing mp3 download of it or something but it's not exactly easy because it's not available on spotify it's not available on tidal for, i don't know why that's the first streaming service that jumped to mind it's not really available on any streaming service besides apple music and even then it's sorted on the music videos not albums so it is a very difficult listen and frank ocean did that uh very intentionally uh i want to talk about the history of this thing for a minute actually that's probably, it's probably pretty important. Frank Ocean is probably one of the most mysterious figures in music that I can think of, especially in the modern day. Back then you probably had people like Nick Drake and no one else is really jumping to mind right now. But my point is he's a very mysterious figure in that he's not very vocal, especially in the last few years. He hasn't really said much. Like he popped out at Coachella last year. That didn't go very well. Um, and he hasn't released an album since 2016. He was going to do something in 2020 that really didn't uh, fall through. Um, but essentially, it's been whittled down to the general history of Frank Ocean, specifically his discography. Is well, he put out the Nostalgia Ultra mixtape in 2011, um, and then the the label picked him up, and he made Channel Orange, and then he made Blonde. But that's not true because right in between Channel Orange and Blonde, well, not right in between, much closer to the release of Blonde, as in a day before, he released this. Endless, and this is an album that is unbelievably overlooked by Frank Ocean fans because I think it is just as worthy of critical discussion and analysis as Blonde or Channel Orange. Matter of fact, I might even prefer it to Channel Orange, not to Blonde. That is an otherworldly. I'm actually an official person with that. Um, I'll probably make a video on that at some point, but right now I want to focus on this. Endless is an odd release. I didn't get that. Could you try again? No, I don't think I will. Ser did she f What the f***? She picked up on everything I said in the last minute. <sighs> okay, so a general history on this album. It's probably one of the most famous stories in modern music history. Uh, a, a lot of people know about it if you know anything about Frank. Um, in 2011, he released Nostalgia Ultra. It was a mixtape um, to prove to record labels that he had potential. And I mean, it was pretty well received. Um, granted, it's difficult to listen to. Just like Endless, it's not on streaming services. 
bar a couple of singles. I think Novocaine and Swim Good are available on most streaming services. But it's very difficult because a lot of the samples haven't been cleared. It's a mixtape. It uses stuff like Hotel California or MGMT's, uh, f I forgot the name of the song. Put, put it on the screen. Or a Strawberry Swing by Coldplay. Those samples aren't going to get cleared, especially in the case of uh, Hotel California. There was a whole debacle about that. But essentially, what that mixtape did achieve was it got eyes on Frank Ocean. Specifically, by Def Jam. Def Jam saw the potential in this guy because he really brought some a new angle to R&B that a lot of artists weren't bringing at that point in time. He, he had this very soulful, relatable approach um, that really resonated with a lot of teenagers at the time. Um, and overall, it was just an impressive mixtape. And they gave him a lot of money to make Channel Orange, which is, is right here. Um, I only have the CD, because this isn't available officially on vinyl. Um, I've come across a few bootlegs, but uh, it's too much. Um, and Channel Orange is a great album. Um, it's a very nice, polished, expensive-sounding album. It's very grand. Um, you can tell it cost a lot of money to make. Um, and I think it's great. And even more so than Nostalgia Ultra, it pushed Frank into that limelight. People's eyes were on Frank Ocean. So, of course, what he did was disappear. I mean, yeah, he dropped a few snippets here and there, and, you know, he was talking on Tumblr pretty actively, but musically, he was pretty quiet from 2012 to 2016, but that's because he was making not only one album, but two. Two, this is my fingers, two. Ah. But you see, Frank was in a very interesting position where he was in a contract with Def Jam to make two albums. He fulfilled his first one with Channel Orange, um, but that second one, it was a work in progress. He felt like he was re uh, restricted creatively and he wasn't making as much money as he could. He was earning a very small amount of profit. Um, so what he did was make two albums. Number one, he made Endless. This is sort of his throwaway album, not to diminish how brilliant it is, um, but he essentially made this as the supplemental album, the one to fulfill his contract. So he released this um, as uh, to fulfill his contract um, but he made it very limited, as in it was only available as a music video on Apple Music. It was a live stream leading up to the release of Endless. It was it was a very complicated thing. There was the, him building a staircase. It's cool. But what he did was he released that, fulfilled his contract, and then the very next day he released Blonde uh, independently, which meant he got all the money from it, and Def Jam sobbed for hours. Probably, I don't, I, I don't think that's actually what happened. My point is, uh, Blonde happened... And it, it, it debuted number one on the charts. It kind of revolutionized uh, R&B as it was then. And now it's considered one of the most iconic albums of the last decade or just the 2010s in general. I'd argue maybe even of all time. Now, like um, Apple Music put out their top 100 albums recently and it was what, like number five? It's a pretty iconic album now, which is crazy to me. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. I think it's like a top three, maybe even top two. I don't know. But a lot of people gravitate towards Blonde. They will be like, this is incredible. It is. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant album. But what a lot of people don't really pay attention to is the album that came out just one day before it. This thing, Endless. Um, because it's difficult to find, man. Like, it's not an easy album to get officially in any way. Um, you're on the options now to watch the Apple Music, uh, like, music video, which is the whole album, 45 minutes, or you could try to find an official copy. Uh, the vinyl are going for 200, or oh, 500, actually, not 200. I, I haven't seen one recently, but I know they're going very high prices. Then you have, like, the VHS and the DVD CD combo pack, which are also going for very, very high prices. Listening to this album is damn near impossible, um, if you want to do it officially. Which is a shame, because it's a really brilliant album. Of course, Frank only released it as a, a supplemental release to Blonde to get out of his contract, so I don't think he views it as highly as he does Blonde, or even Channel Orange, or any other work he's made, but I, I think it's, it, it's a brilliant piece, um, and I want to talk about it a bit. Um, yeah. What I really appreciate about Endless is that it feels like this holistic, singular concept. Every song flows, well, almost every song flows into the next, um, because it's not thought out as, like, an individually tracked album. It was later on when the official releases came out and had official track listings, but when this came out, it was a 45-minute piece, um, with less so songs and more so ideas to this video of Frank building a staircase. Um, the music video, if you want to call it that, or the, um, the, the movie, whatever you want to call it, it was black and white, and it was Frank in a warehouse, the one presented right here on this cover, building a staircase. Um, the staircase itself was actually rainbow. Um, you don't really notice that in the video because it's completely black and white. 
Um, and I don't know how much symbolic meaning there is behind it. He ends up walking up the staircase at the end. I really like the idea of it being this idea of escaping the modern world. The whole album has these concepts of disconnection and being lost in th this technological world. Um, later pressings, like the like the, the official vinyl and the DVD and CD and all of that, don't have uh, the opening track device control and the closing track device control reprise. But I think they're very re I don't love them, but they're very relevant to this uh, the whole concept of the album because they symbolise us being controlled by our devices. It's it's in the name of the damn song. I think it's really cool though. Um, and th this pressing does actually have device control, so that's the one-up it has on any official release, uh, besides the Apple Music music video. So overall, as simplistic as the music video is, or the- whatever you want to call it, I'm gonna call it a music video. I think it does have some really cool symbolism in it, um, and I really appreciate what Frank was trying to do artistically with that, and how it reflects the themes in the album, even if subtly, um... But on top of all of that, uh, besides you put the music video aside, um, I don't. Every, m most of the time I listen to this, I'm not listening to it with the music video. I listen to it as an album. I put headphones on and I listen to the music because ultimately that's what matters here, even if it didn't matter that much to Frank. Um, and I think once you let it sip for a while, it sinks in as a very rich. Uh, project. It's very ethereal. Um, it takes you to another world almost. You know, it's. It's pretty brilliant. From the opening track, it's listed on the back here, I think. No, it's not, okay. Well, you can look at the back for now. You've been looking at the front for way too long. Um, from the opening track, At Your Best You Are Love, a cover of the Isley Brothers ballad, um, which is beautiful. Frank's voice is angelic. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard it in such higher register, especially for an extended period of time. It's gorgeous. It talks about um, him loving someone and this very tender relationship that is maybe doubtful at times, but ultimately it's the thing that matters the most to Frank um, and this woman or man or whoever it is he's in love with. And the way that just flows so seamlessly into Alabama is really cool. It's this really uh, short, but also very experimental song featuring Sumford towards the end doing these cool overdubs. Um, I really like it. Um, it's not a track you listen to on its own a lot. Granted, a lot of the tracks in here you don't listen to on their own a lot. Of the 19 tracks on here, um, not including the uh, two device control tracks, I'd say only about eight of them are fully fledged tracks um, that Frank is singing on, um, and there's this this whole proper structure to them. And what I really appreciate about, like I said, what I really appreciate about this album is that it it, it often feels like one fully cohesive thought. It never feels like individual tracks, not a lot of the time, at least. And while that does take away from the experience for some albums, I think in this case it works in its favour a lot. Um, of course you have stuff like Unity as well, spelled U-N-I-T-Y with the, the, the dashes in between, which has this really trippy, uh, like, ethereal beat, this really nice, it's not a string section, like, these horns, um, backed by Frank, just very, uh, rapping, very laid back, um, and it focuses, again, on love. A big theme of this album is love, which I think is really cool. But of course you have these shorter tracks, especially the two ambient tracks titled Ambience 1 and 2, um, the first one being sampled from the 1977 song, I Think I Am In Love With You. They don't feature Frank at all, but they're these really cool tracks to break up the album. And, and I like that. I, I, I keep moving my hand because I don't know what to do. My point is, I think it's really cool. Um, and beyond that, you have these shorter tracks that aren't samples. They are Frank singing, rapping, whatever. And sometimes, I think the one thing I could dock from this album is that, while I do appreciate it's one cohesive, like, string of ideas and the fact that so many of the tracks are these short experimental sketches, if you will. I do wish some of them were longer, stuff like Comme des Garçons, which talks about Frank's affinity for a man, as far as I can tell, um, with lyrics like, Fuck, I, I don't think I can confidently repeat them with other people in this house. My, my point is, it's a great, it's a really cool song. Um, and I wish it was longer, because that second half is such a bot, man, the way he, he just keep, repeats the title of the song over and over, but it's done to this really cool, trippy, laid-back beat. I really like it, I wish it was longer. But of course among these longer songs and these ambient samples and these uh, shorter sketches for songs, there are also really cool instrumental pieces. Or not instrumental, they do feature Frank, but he's not singing. With stuff like Sideways, which is this really cool instrumental piece. It reminds me of, um, if anyone knows the, the THX logo, the fucking. It's that, but really ethereal. And the way that flows into Frank harmonizing gorgeously on Florida. It feels like you're ascending to heaven. It's another worldly track, man. But ultimately, as cool as these ideas are, and as much as I appreciate the way it feels like this one cohesive thought, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk more about the, the vocal tracks, the, the like the fully-fledged tracks that have a, a proper structure. 
because ultimately it is it is what Frank brings to this album vocally that matters just as much, if not more than anything else. Um, and that is proven more than ever with songs like Rush's. My personal favorite on the album is Higgs, uh, named after the Higgs boson particle. Um, and it, it describes this really tender relationship that is so precious to the narrator, in this case, Frank. Um, and he has this inherent fear of it fading away. The way Frank's voice uh, kind of breaks in the second half, it, it, it's gorgeous. Um, and you can tell he was very passionate. Um, that whole last section where he's just screaming, turn back over and over and over. It, it's, it, it, you can tell he's like, fucking, I don't even know what word I could use. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, that's the, that's the best I can give. Um, I would like to break down the song more. Matter of fact, I might even make it its own separate video, Breaking Down Higgs, because it is such a special song that I think is very overlooked in his, uh, like the grand scheme of his discography. But ultimately it is, um, a, a gorgeous song and the way it describes a relationship is so open and honest and I, I really don't see many songs that are able to describe love so well um obviously it's different for everyone uh but the way frank describes it here it is brilliant in my opinion um but just it, i love that song but that's not to undermine how many other great songs there are in here stuff like rushes um which has the, these really cool overdubs that interpolate some of the earlier songs on the album um, and the way it follows, uh, sorry, it precedes Rushes 2, which is this really cool instrumental track leading into Higgs. Um, it gives me Aphex Twin vibes almost. It has this really cool laid back trippy beat, um, no uh, vocals on it. But in terms of instrumentals on the album, I think that's probably my favorite. Um, it's nothing too out there or ethereal or anything, but it's really cool to just lay back to. It's probably the only instrumental that I'll usually like listen to on its own. Um, but, but, but even then, it's like... Uh, it's hard to listen to these songs on their own, man. This fucking Frank makes it so impossible to find this album. But of course, amongst these very, like, heartfelt songs, these very soulful songs where Frank is singing beautifully, there are also more rap-oriented songs, stuff like, um, Unity or Slide On Me. Um, those are the two that come to mind, like, off the top of my head. Um, Slide On Me particularly has this really cool, like, repetitive beat, almost like a, a trap-like beat. Um, which I really like. It has this really cool chorus where he's just repeating slide on me, slide off me, um, and a few other words, but the, the general theme of it is sliding on and sliding off. And I mean, if you hadn't pieced it together, um, it, it's it's kind of like coming on and off, no, not coming, oh god, oh fuck. It's kind of like this on and off relationship where someone keeps coming back and forth to Frank, sliding on him, sliding off him. I think it's cool. And ultimately, it's just a very fun song. I think if Frank released this traditionally, Slide Me would have had a lot of potential as like a radio single. But this is Frank Ocean we're talking about. He released one single for Blonde, and it was Nikes. So, what? God damn it, Frank. I've got the track list up next to me right now to see if I've missed anything that I think is worth talking about. I'll listen to stuff like Xenon, so Hublots, which are really cool pieces to break up the album. Again, very short experiments, similar to something like Alabama. But ultimately, there's just not much to say about them. They're cool. I think the last track worth mentioning is Mitsubishi Sony, or stylized on some versions of the Mitsu Sony. Um, if you don't count device control, which most later issues of the album don't, uh, Mits Mitsu Sony, or Mitsubishi Sony, uh, closes the album, and it's a cool closer. It's this very surreal, weird, experimental, electronic track, um, with th this, like, manipulation of Frank's vocals, and this really aggressive, um, almost like trap beat. Um, the way it kind of breaks down in the second half is really cool. I don't know if it's the best closer for the album, though. Um, I think Higgs is a brilliant closer. Um, although, again, I, as, as much as I love the song, again, I actually don't know if it works as a closer, so... I'm very iffy. I think Mitsubishi Sony is a nice track, and if you view it less uh, as, like, individual tracks and more as one cohesive idea, uh, like I said before, and then I think it works a lot better. And that is all I have to say about Endless, the music. Next up, Endless the vinyl. What I have here, as I've mentioned a few times before, is a bootleg. The only official vinyl pressing of this album was released uh, for 24 hours on Frank's website on Black Friday, um, similarly to Blonde as it was in 2016, um, amid a device control and device control reprise, and it's going for really stupid numbers these days. Unlike the original pressing of Blonde, which was done in limited numbers, you could actually order as many of these as you wanted for that 24 hour period, B but like it's still fairly rare. Um, I've seen it in the ballpark of around $500, $600 official pressings, which is a bit of a shame because I think the, uh, the official pressing is really cool. For starters, it has this really nice cover. Um, unlike the bootleg, it's white and it has this, uh, uh, like, uh, what's it say? 
some 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 along the lines of like uh, new dimensional stereos. I can't remember what the f it says. It also has this really cool uh, reflection to it. So if you put it in the right spot, it will kind of have like this rainbow prism effect um, when the light hits it. Granted, it's probably not best to let light hit your vinyl records, but if it looks cool, it looks cool. It was also an etched vinyl record. Um, only side one and side three of the two records actually had the music on it, and then sides two and four of either record. Um, had etchings on them that had like the titles of the song and um, I also really like the inner label It's like this kind of folding in circle. I don't know what you'd call it, but I really liked it um, I also like the sleeves. They aren't polyline, so I'm gonna dock them for that um, They probably do scratch the records, but it was uh, they had these really cool details on the album It had lyrics and these images. I really like the sleeves for that one Although I'm not going to pay like $600 worth so I can get some cool etchings, a sticker, and, and some nice sleeves that are ultimately probably going to scratch the records anyways. I'm very happy with this bootleg pressing. I actually found this fairly recently. I was at the record store. Uh, shout out to Rocking Horse Records uh, up in Brisbane. Uh, I, was war I was in there one day, and I saw a copy of Channel Orange uh, vinyl. It was like $150, so I was like, f*** that. Um, and I was like, that's cool. I'm probably not going to get it though, because at that point I already had the CD. Um, and right before I left, I thought, you know what would be mad funny if they had, like, a bunch of bootlegs here and not just Channel Orange? And lo and behold, they had, like, Channel Orange, Nostalgia Ultra, Endless, uh, the Channel Live record. I imagine they even had, like, Blonde at some point earlier, but someone probably already bought it. I mean, it's Blonde, but I don't blame them. And at that point, I already had Blonde too, so I wouldn't have been too miffed, uh, anyways. But they did have this for also not a very good price, but it's, it's Endless, okay? I had to. Um, and I'm very happy to own it. I mentioned earlier in the video that I would only, like, talk about a record if there's something cool about the record itself. The more I think about it, though, there isn't much cool about this one. I mean, it's nice to look at and just hold. Um, the fact that I own them, this is cool. Let's, let's take it out of sleep. Give me a minute here. I can't do it in front of it. It's very difficult. You can enjoy my sticker wall. Uh, these are all stickers from records I've bought or from other places I've got. And a Rocking Horse Records. Oh, that's the place I just mentioned. Um, Endless. Let's get it out. Is your own that's taken out of the sleeve. Does not have a reflective sticker. Um, but what it does have is two records inside. Um, I'll, I'll probably only show you the first one. They're both the same aside from the track listing. I'll just put that down for now. Um, you like I said, you do have device control on this. I don't know how easy that is to see. I'll see if I can like kind of turn it around. Good enough. As I mentioned, you have device control in here. You have, uh, it credits uh, at your best as, a, as an Isley Brothers cover, which I think is cool. I don't think the official pressing does that. Um, what I like about this version is, um, is the label actually has all the tracks listed. Granted, you do have the etchings on the, um, the actual record that lists all the tracks, but it's cool on here to see all the tracks listed. Um, granted, that does bring about some issues. Since this was, uh, pressed before the official track listing was released as part of, like, the, the official vinyl release, a lot of the tracks are credited incorrectly. Um, as in, uh, where is it? It's on the second record. I guess there is something worth showing on the second record. Um, this one doesn't actually credit, um, uh, Mitsubishi, Sony, or device control. It thinks Higgs, um, is device control and Mitsubishi, Sony together, and, uh, Rushes 2 is not Rushes 2, it's actually Higgs. Um, it's very difficult to explain unless you've actually heard the album and you, you, you know the track listing and you know what I'm talking about. But it kind of stuffs up a lot of the track listing. I don't really mind all things considered because like I've got the album here. It might uh, list it incorrectly, but all the music is still there. Um, it actually has more than the official pressing. Um, because like I've said for about the sixth time now, it has device control. F*** you, Frank's official label. Blonded. You don't have that. But yeah, ultimately, there's not uh, too much cool about the records. They have Coke bottle clear. I'll see if I can get that. Again, take it out. I'm going to try not to actually touch the records themselves. I also don't know how well it will show up on camera, but yeah. Coke bottle clear. You've got this, like, green kind of thing. You've got the, I guess what you would call the Coke bottle clear. I don't know what the, It's a very weird thing to call something. Coke bottle clear. It looks like someone took a shit. Um, but it's cool. I like it. I think it's a cool design. They had another pressing that I think was pink. I didn't really pay attention. Um, when I bought it, to which one was which, I just saw Endless and ran with it. Um, ultimately, I'm just really happy to own it. Um, and this pressing sounds pretty good. There's a bit of surface noise, particularly on side three, which I find weird. The other sides are mostly fine. Um, and it's so cool to listen to. It transports me to another world on the turntable, more so than 
if I listen to it on, on like just through headphones on Spotify local files or the, the Apple Music or whatever the hell I'm listening uh, to it on. And it really reminded me like, wow, this is a brilliant album. And the fact that Frank's throwaway album that he released just to get out of his contract is as good as it is, says a lot about Frank as an artist. Um, it is very difficult for him to release a bad song. That sounds like top tier glazing, but like, ugh. it's a good album. I'll tell you what, I might bring this back here. Uh, just, just so you have something to look at that's not the sticker wall. Um, Endless is has such an ethereal, dreamy landscape to it. It is an album you just sit down, lay back, and listen to as a whole, rather than just its its, its individual parts. It's so much more than the sum of its parts. Um, it is brilliant, and it's really a shame that you can't listen to it uh, in many places officially, because I think if Frank released this on streaming services and made it more readily available, it would stand the test of time just as much as Blonde or Channel Orange would. Ah, who am I kidding? He's never releasing anything on streaming services again.